I like a good cocktail every now and then, but this is like a four cocktail picture. Hello and welcome to the California Tiki Podcast, where we explore America's mid-century fascination with Polynesian idols, pineapple cocktails, and coconut palm trees. This week, for our third episode, we talk about Cobra Woman, the 1944 South Seas adventure movie starring Maria Montez. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of fans who have seen it, so warning, spoilers ahead. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, co-author of California Tiki, coming this August from the History Press. With me in Los Angeles is Adam Foschko, screenwriter and director of story development for Call of Duty, Skylanders, and the Destiny franchises, including story consultant on Destiny 2. Say hello, Adam. How are you tonight, Jason? I am so excited to talk about this movie, this weird, weird, deeply weird movie. Okay. All right. Here's what Wikipedia says, and then I, I just want to hear your opening thoughts about Cobra Woman. Okay. Cobra Woman is a 1944 American South Seas adventure movie directed by Robert Cyril Mack, starring Maria Montez and, jo and John Hall. This was a duo that were in a lot of movies together, and their faithful companion, Sabu, shot in Technicolor. It is very typical of her career at Universal Pictures, and uh, it's venerated as a camp classic. There are a lot of people who really enjoy a lot of the uh, the sets and the, and the symbolism and the strange accent of Maria Montez. Uh, Leonard Malton gave it three stars. This is Cobra Woman. And just to put this into perspective, this is the same year that uh, – what else What else came out in, in 1944? Uh Let's see, Gaslight came out in 1944. Gone wow. with the Wind came out six years before 1944. Just to put in perspective, <laughs> the world that this movie exists in. Yes. So okay. they knew how to make pictures, yeah. They knew how to make movies. <laughs> now, tell me about Cobra Woman. I got to tell you, I, I had forgotten about this picture. I think you just, I think Leonard Maltin and then you may have just called it a, uh, we certainly just called it a, a forgotten camp classic. You know, I think that that speaks for itself and, and is a, it sells it fairly well. Uh, it is the, one of the strangest movies I've seen in a really long time. Like the fact that it was made this way intentionally boggles the mind. Um, I think I think we're you know we're taking it on as a as stressing on the South Sea adventure part of it, which is very tiki. So I think this is where the intersection of 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 this sort of you know of genre actually and uh, maybe maybe even a dash of sensationalism. Um, intersects with South Sea Adventure, yeah. uh, and 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 I see it. You know, you could look at the the poster and say, okay, this promises to be a a a um, a rollicking adventure with a certain amount of you know danger and thrills and escape. And this is you know this is very cheeky. This is very you know with the Cobra Woman, you get the idea like cat people or yes. uh, I don't know the reptile, which is which is like pictures that we've seen. Uh, you know with the the sort of like where whatever where reptiles where cats where whatever there is not a where snake in this entire picture. It right. it is one of the craziest things somehow between the the casting which we'll go into in a minute and and the uh the unbelievable accents from all over the place yes. um and and you know these people with the crazy one syllable names uh you know living in exotic places and then they have ch a chimp as a pet and then you know they go off to this crazy cobra island and then Lon Chaney appears out of nowhere and has a place in this movie you know it is between that and the sets and the and the crazy writing it is absolutely wonderful really when you get down to it because it it is one of those pictures that you would put you would have on a saturday afternoon and you would just let it play and you would just you would just let it go it has uh it has a lot of charm it's there's nothing sort of bad natured about this movie the the the, the adventure is kind of there it's I could see why Leonard Maltin didn't just shoot it out of the sky because for all of its terrible sets and its ridiculous writing and not particularly good acting in places, there's something enormously charming about it. And you can just, there's nothing bad natured. You just kind of let it go. And it, right. it kind of has a mind of its own, not in the well, way. And it's the, existing the, in a the, world that, that is completely divorced from our own, even in 1944. There's there. Uh, a lot of people have written about the fact that, the, the South Seas presented in a movie like Cobra Woman 
are a South Seas that are, and this is where it fits into the idea of tiki culture, which is the idea of an exotic environment that's intended to be real, but one essentially of, it's a real dream. There is no, there's no sense that you could actually get on a plane and go to any of the places. Cobra Woman starts out, like the movie begins not in the cult of the, the Cobra cult island, which is a place that exists in this movie, but on a wholly different uh, South Seas island that is that is occupied by some some Scottish people and uh, or at least one Scottish guy one one Scottish guy and this is the kind of movie where when the Scottish guy is on screen Scottish music plays on the soundtrack you know it's one of those, those totally like you know and and uh, his his good friend uh, John Hall is getting married to the beautiful Maria Montez who our Scottish guy has raised since she was a little girl. And then on the night before, oh, and we also meet Sabu, their faithful companion, who is a sort of monosyllabic, fairly smart, but teasing native boy. You know, the, the, the Eurocentrism and the ethnocentrism definitely on display this is definitely a universal picture of this of this period but but, but john uh, hall play, plays a play someone named ramu which makes no sense yeah that makes no sense either uh because john Ma- john hall plays that part as though he's indiana jones he has a sort of square jawed swagger he talks with a kind of with 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 a, with a kind of uh sarcasm that that is completely the kind of thing that indiana jones was was ta- taking off and likewise uh that charlton heston was doing in in movies like uh song of the Incas. uh so the night before uh john hall is to get married to maria montez again you're right his name is ramu the very very caucasian white square jawed ramu right. the night before he is to marry <laughs> Maria Montez, who plays Talia, she is kidnapped off the island and back to uh, the the island of the snake cult, the, the, the cobra cult. So off he goes to, to Cobra Island, and it is there that Chipotle, we... Chipotle. He's, he, she's kidnapped. She's kidnapped actually by the the blind, not blind Lon Chaney Jr. Oh who my just God! Rolls yes. his eyes up into his head. Lon Chaney Jr. Who, uh, who basically is the golem who is sent to basically retrieve her from this place where she escaped some years before with the Scottish guy as a as a baby and yes. was raised inexplicably put in his boat when he himself made an escape from Cobra Island as he was about to be killed because he was a stranger because all right. on Cobra Island, except he inexplicably escapes. He wakes up, he's tortured into unconsciousness, wakes up on his boat, and there's a baby on board too. So he takes the baby home and raises her uh, yeah. as his own. And this is the woman who is to be married. And she has two very strange uh, uh, scars on her wrist, uh, which are basically they're like puncture wounds. They, they are scars so, uh, that look like open wounds. I mean, they're pretty. Yeah, they're not. They're, yeah, they're not they, they haven't healed. Uh, yeah, at you all. Know. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on. Clearly, it's a it's a it's a cobra bite from from many years ago or five minutes ago, depending on how you're looking at it. It's, uh, it's but so this absurd. is this is the woman who is who is kidnapped, and there's a yeah. repartee somehow between the Scotsman and. <laughs> And also the and Lon Chaney and this and this kid with a monkey who mm-hmm. who who sort of runs throughout this entire picture. Um, and and, and yeah, since we're all about like the spoilers, that. we may as well sort of uh, uh, tie that together. Though the reason why Scottish guy who had came to the island and was to be killed, the reason why he was set free with the baby is that, as we learn later, the the grandmother, who is ostensibly the queen but has no power on the Cobra Cult Island, she put the baby onto the Scottish guy's boat so that it would survive because otherwise they didn't need twins to be queen. They needed one, and so they were going to kill the other one. And so they she, she put this... That's why she would have saved the Scottish guy, put him on the boat, gave him the baby, off he goes. Now the baby is of age, and she has sent for that baby to be kidnapped back to become a benevolent ruler um unasked we do not ask why would you why couldn't you have just raised the good the the other queen not to be evil you know that would have been good and how did you find this one anyway is how did you find julia in the wherever she was going far away from from Cobra Island, and then other questions you want to ask. My goodness, I don't know. I mean, but we don't know any of that going in. We just know that 
she's been abducted and and the Scottish man tells uh basically tells uh uh Ramu that you should just forget her and move on and he goes no i'm going and gets into his boat and heads towards um uh cobra island but uh <laughs> with sabu in uh, as a stowaway inside as a, his own as boat. a stowaway because that's just how these things work in these movies it, it's, I would, it, I, of course you know i oh my god why do, how does lois lane get to come on the trip she sneaks onto the plane it just is just what how does boy manage to follow tarzan all the way to the to the village of the of the, the aliens because he stows away. It's just how I, I got to tell you, I happen. was pretty sure that was that was a thing growing up. I thought that that was a way you could get around. Was <laughs> possibly because I watched many of these movies as a kid. I was like, oh, you know, sure, I could get to wherever Grand Canyon, New York. I don't know space. Who cares? But yes. I think later, like I could stow away. Not but thinking for space. a minute that that would just be a terrible idea. People did get to, well, at least in the movies, they get to space by stowing away. Sure they do. Absolutely. Yes. So anyway, they get to the Cobra Cult Island. So so here is the thing that the listener, if the listener is interested in watching this movie, you can really skip everything, honestly, up to the point where they get to the island and then just watch it from there because that's where all the good stuff is. Um let us count the ways. <laughs> First of all, it's 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 beautiful. The color is gorgeous. It's really Technicolor. gorgeous. Technicolor. Yeah, it's Technicolor. It's not right. really shot in the South Seas. It's actually shot somewhere in Burbank, but it's beautiful. It's really you know you've got you've got um, these these giant throne rooms. <laughs> they don't look like super expensive as much as you know some other films of the period, but you know but it, the. It, What's going on with a spectacle like this is I think you're supposed to be sitting in there watching this movie, right? It's Friday night, you're with your family, or you got a date or whatever, and you're watching the movie. And I think the idea is, oh my God, look at all these guards coming in and they've got big spears and there's and they're wearing hats with big golden things on them. And here's all these women, you know, dancing and here's all this gold shimmering and stuff. I think it's just supposed to just dazzle you. And and in a, in a way, you can be dazzled by it and just just watch it and and you know if you look closely, it none of it makes any sense at all. Okay, a key, no, I mean I mean yeah. I mean her her accent makes no sense. The her fact that the guards hilarious. are all dressed pretty much like they're Indians, you know, they're, yes. they're 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 Eastern Indians, yeah, uh, as opposed to I don't know being in the South Seas, completely different. No one in the South Seas is dressed like this, and they, you know you might have a you. It would be a Raja would show up in this. At some well, those point. hats the, that they're wearing they, are Peruvian hats. They're wearing they're wearing they're wearing Peruvian hats. They're supposed to be somewhere in the South Seas. Uh, Maria Montez, who plays both a girl who is who has grown up with a Scottish man on a South Seas island, and who also right. has grown up as the evil queen of a South Seas island. Both of those characters have a uh, an accent from. Uh, Dominican Republic, because that's and, why and the, and the same accent, no less. Yes, which is not surprising, but <laughs> they, they uh, and it, and her accent is so beautiful. It's beautiful to listen to. What's what's going on here? This is uh, Universal had this thing where they would they would match people up. So so John Hall and Maria Montez made. I am not making this up. Six movies together, where they played the uh, the love story the you know the, the romantic leads and and he was an adventurer and blah blah this is exactly what also was going on at exactly the same period with Ricardo Montalban and Esther Williams where uh, in that oh, sure. case, he's the exotic one she's the American um, those movies involved a lot more swimming because Esther Williams was was really into swimming but uh, you know th this is just you know, you, this would definitely not be a lead movie, but you'd you'd go to it and it's like, oh, well, great. OK, we have a John Hall and, Mon and Maria Montez adventure this week. You know, how how awesome is that? Sure. And that seems like a thing that you would you would if they were on the bill, you would go see it and be like, oh, this is a South Sea adventure. Sure. Yeah. We're on board. This yes. Is a, 
thir- third picture they did together, I want to say. Which one was this? I don't know, actually. I don't know what number. Because it was... It, it might be the third that they did together. Um, I'm not sure trying to remember, but it was like, one of those, it's one of those things where it seems like you were more about the matchup at that time. Yeah. Even, I think, if you were watching these movies, than kind of what the movie was about. Like, you weren't looking for... Like, now we go, oh, it's a... this It's this kind of a picture. Who's in it? So-and-so. And, you know, it's... It's uh you know Tom Cruise is in it. Great. You're not necessarily going out to go see a Tom Cruise picture. You're going to go yeah. see this kind of picture, and Tom Cruise is in it. And this is more like these people are in it. Oh, where are they this time? They're where doing they, right. this. Right. Like Sonny sure, and Cher are doing board. skits, right? You know, it's like okay, great, okay, Sonny and Cher right. are or doing maybe a, a even, Wild maybe West Maybe even uh, yeah. maybe even Abbott and Costello, or maybe even in other in, in another kind of genre approach was uh, uh, if it was uh, Karloff and Lugosi, if they right. were paired up in something, I was like, what are they going to do? Well, this could be Black Cat. Really? Great. Want to see it. Uh, and maybe that's the way, maybe that's the way it was approached then because otherwise it's, it's inexplicable. Yes. <laughs> you, you really just go, was this a vehicle for and they and they got a, they got a, attached to it. It's like no, it was this was built up around yeah. them. They were kind of like we need something for them, and I think they just kind of went, how about this? And it and it and it kind of spun out from them. I think these were all contract players. So I think Lon Chaney was under contract with Universal then, and it made sense that he was taking a yeah. break from whatever he was doing. That I don't. I'd actually look up his filmography at the time to see where this fell in. But you know, it's a. Uh, it's a really weird departure for him because we're used to seeing him in all kinds of other stuff. Uh, not Chaney, at all like this. The Lon Chaney Wolfman, I want to say, was like 1943 or 44. Let's see what year that was. Lon Chaney Jr. Wolfman. Um, 1941. Oh, I apologize. Uh, so the Lon Chaney Jr. Wolfman is 1941. This is three years after that. Three years after that. Think about that. Lon Chaney Jr. was the lead in that movie. He played the romantic lead and also the villain, you know, because it's a, you know, it's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, basically. Sure. That's astonishing because... But, I mean, yeah. go, keep going, keep going. Well, I mean, he's he, he speaks, he dances, he's, you know, he, he's the romantic lead. And here he's under all of this cloth and he's barely even seen and he's mute, which is nuts. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, in what year, I wonder so what, what year do, Werewolf of London was. What did he do? Uh, Werewolf of London. What did he do after is the other question. So my guess is this was just a thing that he did. This could have taken him longer than a week. Yeah, that's true. Sort of show up and do this. It's like, you know, while I'm in between pictures, I'll keep fulfilling my contract. I think it's just one of those. He's Lon not Chaney like, Jr. Oh, he said it would be good. Lon Chaney Jr. played the Wolfman in 1941. And then the Ghost of Frankenstein. He was the monster in 1942. He was yep, in The yep. Mummy. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman in 1943. He played Dracula in in Son of Dracula in 1943. That was a famous movie. And then this All is right. the year after he played Dracula. I can only assume that he... Oh, and in House of Frankenstein, he's a lead. He plays Larry Talbot in that. So is this that, is really... Is that after? But, that, but that's a, that is a, not a lesser role, but it is a different role. Of House of that. Was that after this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it's, uh, oh, it's yeah. the same year. So it's uh, released in December. So it's definitely after this movie. Mm-hmm. But this the is, point this is, is him trying to break. This is him just fulfilling a contract and trying to break out. Uh, just, and it's, I it's, think it's just, he's probably fulfilling a contractual commitment just to do stuff. Yeah, this, you know, yeah, this so. is the Lon Chaney Jr. contractual obligation. Yeah, it's sort of amazing the way that, if you think of the way that worked, you had these people who just did movies um, this is their job, you know, it, this is, if you're, it, it, you're, sometimes you're a lead, sometimes you're a whatever the you're under contract and the studio says what you're going to do. We nearly, I should set I should, uh, we should segue just a little bit. You and I nearly did a different movie. And, and the reason why, you know, the reason we chose Cobra Woman is it definitely fits with the idea of, of California Tiki of, of exotic worlds as imagined by Hollywood. We nearly did My Blood Runs Cold, which is also shot yeah. in California, um, and also was shot using contract players, because even though it was 1965, which is 21 years after Cobra Woman, we were still living in a world where 
you could uh, make Troy Donahue just do a movie just because you know he was he was just working for. Oh, the... that's, a, that's a good that's a good one. So he had a, he had a what we call now an overall deal, or he had he already not an overall deal, but he had a a deal to make a certain number of pictures. Yeah, and that just becomes one yeah. of them. Interesting, they were still doing that, and that was Warner Brothers, and uh, we ended up not doing the picture for the show for this show because. I think we both decided it was wonderful, but it's not quite tiki enough. It's it's more gothic and and other stuff. I, I neat film. I yeah. mean, I love watching it, but it doesn't fit doesn't fit the themes that we're dealing with here. But it was the same thing. He was he did that movie. He probably may have liked that movie. In fact, he was really trying with that movie. But he was sick of the studio, and he he forced the studio to let him out of his contract. Um, but to his own detriment. I mean, they, they... Yeah, like that's, that's sort of like almost put an end to his career. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And, and Troy Donahue had to move over basically to television and, and other stuff. And I, I uh, you know, uh, so, yeah. So you went against, you, you went against the uh, studios at your peril. You went against time. Jack Warner. It was never a good thing. I think that was, I guess, right. uh, I, think, <laughs> I think it was probably, he was on contract with Warner Brothers, if I remember correctly. Yes. And I think it was, you know, Jack Warner had, you know, well, anybody who was running a studio at that time had enormous power, and I think that's I think that's what happened with with Donahue. But yeah. um, you know, weirdly enough, as 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 much as I like that movie, you know, this particular one does actually have all the all the trappings of Tiki. Weirdly, and it's all yes. slightly sort of set askew. You Tell know, me it's about not that. Like you're like, well, like, well, how do you how do you well, how do you fit? Where do you find the trappings of Tiki in this in this movie? Well, the I fact that it, right. it, 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 think of it as sort of being, you know, it, it is the South Sea, it's exotic, it's, there's danger, there's yeah. everything that, you know, um, middle America that, you know, which is, this is largely going to be a picture that people are going to see in America, that yeah. they, that they'll just go, oh, it's out there somewhere and it's got, you know, it's got escape, it's got danger, it's got, you know, then it's got, uh, you know, um, um, temples, it's got, Oh, you and know, it's right. And this world is completely made up, but based well, on pieces of, of real things, you know? Like yeah, we but said, they're, but they're not, but they're not, yeah, but they're not held together by, you know, by fact. It's almost by, right. not mythology, but more like legend, more like, you know, you would, it's funny because I think you would hear stories Post World War II, you would hear stories from sailors about these places, but you know, like all good fish stories, there's some truth in them, but they're sort of held together by whatever, yeah. by kind of like the the sense of like the tale being told. This is a this is like a tale that has that you, like if you didn't see this movie, you would basically have someone telling you this story. Yes. And you, if they told it well, you would be riveted. The fact is, here it's because you're watching it; it's entertaining. It's not. It's not extremely well told because you, as, even as you're watching it, you're going, huh. I and mean, we're looking at it in 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 you know 21st through 20th, 21st century eyes. So right. our our sensibilities are probably a little bit different. But you know, somebody could tell you this story <laughs> and and make it exciting. And this is where. Yes. Like a like a sea story, this could be something that would be you know kind of amazing. It isn't like from here to eternity. It isn't no, but, you know. But there's, there's no the, value. You're right about to, if you imagine the the sort of glittering eyed uh, you know fireside story. All the pieces that are there. There's this sort of forbidden sexuality stuff. The fact that that he gets to the island, and he he immediately kisses the girl who is swimming because but it's he's given an excuse it's because and he, he thinks, and he thinks it's right he, he thinks, thinks it's, it's his own it's fiance like, right right and, and it turns but out, it's not right it right. turns out it's the evil twin of the fiance uh and and she's in, in reality he would be killed on the spot let's finish. right however <laughs> but this, since he's a hunk of hunk of burning love he's allowed to wander the island more or less at will Depending on what faction he's sort of wandered into, there's and there's this is the... the island where all strangers are put to death. Let me just remind right. you. Right. <laughs> yes, but but the retinue of girls who work for the queen are kind of down with strangers generally. They they aren't particularly troubled by him. They gossip with him. They sort of give him advice on like. Yeah, who's I don't going think it's their rule. I don't think this is. I don't think they're going. You know, we're going to have them all killed. We're going to have all strangers killed. I don't think they're in favor of this. I think this really comes from like one guy who's like the number two guy on the island, who generally yes. is, is, uh, <laughs> is 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 a terrible person and is is most of the, the trouble of this of this island. This is the actor who plays Martok. Now he Martok. Uh, this actor seems to be like have wandered in 
from I don't know, like a gangster movie or something. He's he's just sort of always. Oh, he's clearly he, he yeah he normally wears a double breasted suit and uh, <laughs> and holding a. He feels very not at home in his outfit. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of things like, um, oh, uh, Radio Ranch. You know, there's a there's a whole thing that Gene Autry did where where he and a, and a if I recall correctly, he and a couple of like uh, stowaway boys wander down to like an undersea world, um, and everybody's wearing weird Roman hats, and and I think there's a I think there's an array of some kind that's going to destroy California, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, it reminds me of that because again, it's all of these like all of these like hardcore Brooklyn gangster guys who for some reason are now wearing these stupid costumes and wandering around with spears and 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 whatever. I, I, um, I would like yeah. to point out that, that oh, go ahead. No, I got nothing there. Go ahead. I want to point out that, that this guy, uh, Martok, who is the actor's name is Edgar Barrier, yep. was actually in a film called The Giant Claw in 1943, and also the 43 version of, uh, of Family Opera. Really? The so, 43? I mean, he actually... Is that, is that the... Uh, for, for, with Claude Rains, right? Is that right? I think that's the... Right, it's got to be, because it isn't Herbert Lom. Right, that would be the 60s one, So that's the 60s right? version. So, okay. It's I be like Claude Rains. 43. I love the forty three Phantom so, of the Opera. So who did he so who did he play in in Phantom of the Opera in forty three is a question. No because idea. that I remember that being a good movie. It is a and good movie. Were, it says here, okay, I've looked it up. Oh my god, he's the Vicomte Raoul. Well that's interesting. Oh, so, I mean that's interesting. So he's you know I mean he pulls that off. Yeah, well, I mean that's a that's always a uh, a you know, really a sympathetic character. That's interesting. Uh, it's a funny. Uh, that, that's a very funny um, movie. In that one, uh, there's a there's like a, a trio. There, there's a love triangle, and it's actually a love square because there's there's Raoul is after uh, Christine, the Phantoms after Christine, but there's also like a policeman who's after Christine. So there's lots of people who are. Um, who are after him anyway or who are after christine it's a good movie uh it's funny it has a comic ending and it's gorgeous it's technicolor but anyway back to cobra woman all right so, all right sorry her. go ahead yes so all right so so she he kisses the, the sister the evil sister who's been ruling the island yeah and what's strange is uh let's see what's strange is you've got um sabu is still running around as well because sabu is stowed away on the on the boat right uh and in and i think is he keeps him from getting connects, eaten by a tiger or a, or a, by a by a by a, a panther by using the yes. blowgun a blowgun that because uh, you know all scotsmen like to hand out blowgun uh right. gave him a blowgun and that seemed to work on the panther and then there's this bit between the kid and and Coco, who is the chimp, who was oh, Talia's pet, I think, back on the mainland, who I think I guess got abducted with her, and they show up, they reconnect in the island again. So now it's like Sabu and Coco, which I'm sure was a great act on the road later <laughs> that year. Um, and well, this actor Sabu, so th this guy uh, is actually a famous Indian actor, and I'm trying to find his name. Okay, 20, the character's name 20. is, I'm not making this up, the character's name is Kato. We're calling him Sabu because the actor's name is Sabu, and so I just remember that because it's like flashed really big on the screen. His his uh, name was uh, Sabu Dastagir. He was uh, Indian. He had American citizenship. He did a lot of movies. Uh, as, as sometimes a romantic lead and sometimes a, a supporting character. Uh, and he also served in the war, holy mackerel, as a tail gunner. Good Christ. Wow, that's, that's kind of amazing. Yeah. So anyway, this guy had a very, a very colorful, uh, colorful career and um, uh, was in a lot of movies. Uh, so he came back from World War II and continued to do movies. But he joined the war. He joined the war to become a tail gunner. This guy, as you're watching Cobra Woman, he joined at right after making this movie. That's mind blowing. So, so he looks like oh a kid. Yes. He's gotta be he's gotta be twenty. He's gotta yeah, be something. But he looks he's, like a young kid because of his this way he looks. Yep. He was uh, he's twenty years old. He was born in nineteen twenty four. Anyway, he plays one of these Hollywood boys of who could be anywhere from like 11 to to you know 20 uh and and it's funny because did you watch uh 
Tommy Wiseau's The Room? It's a it's a dumb question to ask. I don't know. If I've you've I've seen it. I've seen the yeah I saw the original. Well, one yeah, of the weird things about The Room is is this extra character who's like Tommy or whatever he is who lives down the hall. And I, the, what people have observed is that Tommy Wiseau writes his movies uh, because he's ba- like, like based on what he's learned about life from Hollywood movies. And it's true that if you watched a lot of old Hollywood movies, you had a lot of these, these young male characters who were of completely indeterminate age who were there to do nothing but ask stupid questions of the hero and get in trouble, like like get in, in scrapes that the hero had to get them out of and occasionally to to show up and save the hero when somebody needed to show up. And it's nothing that ever happened in real life. These characters are always weirdly aged. And and he's got one of those characters in the room, which we don't do anymore. But that explains, you know, watching something like this explains a lot about why something like that shows up in the room. Um, so tell us about the single most memorable thing about this entire, entire movie. And it is the Cobra Dance. Yeah, that is it, isn't it? That's going to be the thing that everyone remembers no matter what. I mean, there are other things to remember, but it really right. is the Cobra Dance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it. Let's see, how does this get started? We have, well, it happens twice, but the one time that it happens well, uh, essentially what's going <laughs> what on is... It happens the, well. Well, better, <laughs> better. Um, so you and I, interestingly, you and I watched a scene from a 1959 movie called The Indian Tomb, where you yes. had an identical cobra dance, except for it's done really well. But <laughs> it's, 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 it's really, it's, yeah, it is done really, really well. And let me yeah. just point out that, I mean, it was when we saw it, so when I saw it, it was done to different music. Right. It's done, uh, right. the 1959 Indian Tomb Cobra Dance, whatever music it was originally used, is used as the music for a video for Martin Denny's uh, Miserloo. And people will know Miserloo as the, the theme, a lot of people would call it the theme to Pulp Fiction. Anyway, Martin Denny did a version uh, a few years before that version. It's used for this Cobra Dance. You got to see this Cobra Dance. It Having is settled, actually really, it's actually really great. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. That's 1959. It, this is 1944. Right. This is weird. Uh, they, the this evil is, queen. This is very weird. She does a dance. So here's what it's supposed to be. She does a dance where she's supposed to hypnotize a cobra, show, show off her power by not getting bitten by the cobra. And then during the ecstasy of the dance, she is going to choose volunteers who will then be locked away until it's time to sacrifice them to the volcano god. Uh Okay, all of that. I, I give you that as a as a choreographer. You come up with however this scene's going to play out. What actually <laughs> happens is, th- first of all, Marie Montez, very sexy woman, terrible dance. This is an awful dance. She just sort of randomly yeah, thrusts it, her shoulders up and back and forward. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's not it's not so much arousing as it is sort of alarming, and you just you you. <laughs> You watch it, and you, you should we should we stop her? Should She's we? circling around is, the cobra. She's this was going so well a minute ago. Perky jerky, her shoulders up and down towards the cobra in her sort of shimmering sequiny structured gown. The cobra again, is staring very, at her. Very good, it's very good natured, so you really just kind of let it go. Yes. <laughs> She's she's picking the volunteers with like gun fingers. I'm not making this up. She's really like like like, like pew pew. Yeah, right. Like, like you and, and you. And again, the cobra you're gonna be stuck is two hundred of them. Oh, <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, I I. This is just the most bizarre. Truly, the most bizarre. And then what's hilarious is later on when the good. The, when Talia has replaced her sister by tossing her off a balcony and has replaced her sister in the throne room, they say, well, prove that you are the queen by recreating the, her, her amazing cobra dance. <laughs> cobra dance. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so wonderful and of course she can't even do that and she doesn't know how to do the gun fingers because who would and so it's you know that that is truly truly one of the most amazing things i've ever seen i i, 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 I hope i hope somewhere on a like in a writer's room when they were making uh seinfeld and they were going god you know elaine needs to do this terrible dance <laughs> and, uh, you know she could do the how about we do this dance from from 
from from, uh, oh, from this movie. And they're like, <laughs> I don't, I don't think we can get by with it. I think we have to do the other thing with the thumb or whatever. So oh I, you know, I, but I think this would have been definitely in the running because it is, uh, it is that. And I should say she wasn't, she didn't throw her sister off. I mean, she was attacked by her sister. I think. True. And, that's that's very true. I, you do have a great scene where the evil twins face off against one another, and uh, she has that that classic line. That that people have really really loved. Do you remember the line? Oh, I know this. Oh, it's yes. a, it's a, it's God. What is it? It's the you give me the. It's like Peter Lorre should have said it. Yes. It's, it's sort of like I give me the give me the cobra jewel. What is it? What give is the line? Give me the cobra jewel. <laughs> yeah. Give me yeah. the cobra jewel. The cobra jewel is what we need. Yes. Oh my God. It's it's wonderful. So it's I mean, kind of unbelievable. It, it, you, no. you you could listen. You could easily dismiss this picture in so many ways. But you know what? It, it's this. There's something about it. It's it's weirdly charming. There's. It's very. It assumes a lot. Yes. In a, in a way which makes you go. It's not like it's not an ugly American picture where no. you're kind of like going, oh well, you know, it's 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 uh, people don't you know because this this idea that. What I'm trying to say is this is the idea that yeah, Amer- Americans could make up, you know, this this sort of this kind of a movie about things happening around the world because they don't care. And it's either that like, the ugly American, like the ugly American will go and will conquer like the like the same movies that would that would send guys in like for the same reason that even like uh, uh, Robert Armstrong went in and conquered, you know, Kong and the island and took Kong away or would yeah. show up and they were, you know, Jungle Woman or whatever. Any of these movies was like the like the, the white American dude's going to show up and, you know, and impose whatever. This is very much like he's doing his thing, you know, uh, and it's a sense of, it's a sense of uh, adventure in the sense of, uh, it's weirdly charming. It's it's not, a, it's not an offensive movie. It, it, it actually could be, it could be well told if it was sort of maybe told a little differently, but it is very, I can see why people would have this. It'd be like a weird guilty pleasure movie. I agree or with you completely. Or you would have it on in the afternoon and just be like, that was good to sort of reconnect with this again. Well, yeah, there's how something great this very movie, interesting. If you were having a party, if you were having a tiki party, right? Think how, how well this movie would play in the background. You don't need music. Right, and that's, you need, and that's, the, that's the thing, yeah. right? You could even play... You don't have to listen to the dialogue or do anything. You can have this running and play yeah. a bit Martin Denny or whatever else. But I think that's the thing, right? It's the it's the collection of all these elements that 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 is what makes it so tiki. The fact yes. that it's got all the different elements attached to it, and it's and it just sort of is. You don't have to follow. You don't have to try very hard. You don't have to do very much. You have to just enjoy it for what it is. And it's sort of you know it it conveys a mood and a style uh, of sort of you know. Of something other than where you are, yeah. other than you know what you have to sort of face. It's an escape that you don't have to think very hard about. In fact, if you do, it breaks. So don't. Right. Um, and I think <laughs> that's, that's. I think and that I think true. for that reason, it may be one of those things that you know is is uniquely tiki in that sense. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, there are certainly other movies that we we will and we could have chosen that are much more serious or much more. Um, much more i'm not even exotic but i mean they really are movies that you know like south pacific or something like that these are movies that are serious pictures that that fulfill some of the same elements mm-hmm. that um that i think are are um serious cornerstones of kind of what we mean when we talk about tiki but in its in its essence this fulfills that as well but maybe even a, in a truer sense because it is so uh, genuinely good-natured and enjoyable, and that makes it even greater than the, sort of the sum of its parts. If I, if that makes sense. Yes. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Because you're right. If you analyze this, it's like picking apart a dream. It makes it makes no sense at all. But if you look at any moment of it, there is not a single moment of this movie that does not look like what it is. If that makes any sense, there's not a moment where you're like, oh, I think this is a tiki kind of film, you know, but there's nothing on the screen. There's always something on the screen that feels exotic and and otherworldly. It's a it it there's only a few movies that fit this bill and this one this is even better than last week's honestly this is this is even better i, I, I agree than and i'm Island. actually delighted that we settled on this one i'm this is one that was not in rotation before but yeah. actually i think i will add this to rotation because it's just that kind of a picture yeah it's pretty amazing as as much as i sort of have gone on you know there are a lot of things about it that if i look at it critically you know, with a cinematic eye or with a story eye or whatever, you know, I might, it might just sort of fall apart, but 
just the fact that it's this, for what it is 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 a snapshot and and it's super charming. So yeah, it's going to be on rotation. Very good. So I think we should we should call it there. You've been listening to the California Tiki Podcast. Uh, look for us. Let your friends uh, know about the show. Uh, come to the Facebook page and let us know what you think and what you might want to be listening to. And also look for the book California Tiki, where we talk about this kind of stuff and lots more. We will be premiering it in August at the uh, Tiki Oasis show. Uh, I don't know what we'll be back with next, but I promise it will be truly odd. And um, uh, Adam, <laughs> sure that. yeah, Adam, thank you so much. For being on and and i will i will see you next time thanks jason always great Thank have a good you. night good night bye